I love that little moment where you have to acknowledge, got it. <laughs> it seems always to me like some kind of strange uh, Zen moment. Um, so even though I'm spotlighted for all of you, I want to see you, not myself. <laughs> um, and it's really great to see you. Hi, Jacqueline. <laughs> Hi, Bonnie. I see some waves. That's very sweet. Hi, Ryoshin. <laughs> um, so welcome, everybody. My name is Gesho, and I'm a senior student here at the Village Zendo in the here that is both uh, everywhere, <laughs> uh, right here where I'm sitting and in the Zendo. Um, so some of you may know that I've mostly been away from New York for the past couple of years. I've been uh, teaching in Vermont and uh, also getting a degree. Um, and that all ended in at the end of December. And so now I'm like back in New York and it feels pretty amazing. And it feels amazing to be able to go to the physical Zendo, even though I'm not there right now. Um, it, it feels amazing to be able to do both things. Um, and one of the things I've been doing uh, since I've been back is looking at art, looking at a lot of art. I live in Chelsea, which is, you know, as you know, right next to the big galleries. Um, and as I walk my dog back and forth to the dog park, we pass a lot of galleries. She has a favorite gallery <laughs> because she's fallen in love with a particular gallery attendant who uh, sits right near the big plate glass window. And so we often have to uh, stop for this very elaborate greeting. I have to take another route if I don't want to stop and uh, try to find that person. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about art and especially about, well, you know, when, you, when you're when about the situation of somebody just walking into a gallery, just seeing art, just there it is. What's it for? And uh, it has brought this, you know, perennial question to my mind, like, what is the point of all of this fantastic amount of effort and money and real estate <laughs> to show me this particular, for instance, abstract painting? Like, what, like, what's all this about? And you would think, I would think um, that I had long ago answered that question. I wrote a whole book to try to answer that question. Um, and I'm an artist. Uh, you would just think I would have it down, but I don't. It's just a perennially deep opening question. And it it does remind me of, you know, what what is Zen? You know, that's also for me a perennial. What's all this about? It's all, always a question for me. Um, it's always a place of not knowing. Um, and happily in Zen, we uh, we prize not knowing. Like Deng Shan's not knowing is most intimate or the Zen peacemakers version of the first uh, pure precept. This is not knowing. You begin everything in not knowing. So I'm sitting with my not knowing. Um, but one of the um, things that's come up for me is the idea that maybe a work of art is in some way like a koan. Um, so I'm going to kind of try to think that through with you guys. Um, right now it's my first time out with this idea and so i don't i don't know we'll see um, it's in i'm in a place of not knowing or of exploring it or this is one aspect of what that might uh, feel like to think through or feel your way through um there are ways of course in which works of art are nothing like koans so like i just want to kind of bracket that and begin there koans are part of a vast teaching literature that's specific to Zen Buddhism or specific to Buddhism. Each koan has a Dharma point um, that it's uh, kind of uh, pointing to. <laughs> um, it's a, uh, they're, they're, they're history, they're part of our history. There are these stories of teachers and students and as Soten pointed out yesterday, Dharma friends in conversation. Um, and works of art are not part of any particular single tradition. I mean, kind of, but they're made by all different kinds of people for all different kinds of reasons. And so we can't look to them for, for any kind of um, 
particular philosophy or answer or point, right? So in that way, they're just very, very different. Um, but one thing might be similar is how we make use of koans and how we make use of works of art. So when we're sitting with koans as part of our study or our practice, we aren't trying to like intellectually understand um, what they're trying to get at, where they come from, what they're about. We might do that stuff. That stuff's fun. I like that stuff. But um, what we're actually trying to do is embody them, is take them into our whole being and, and, and find the place where the koan and ourselves are, are one thing. Um, how is this koan expressed in your actual ordinary personal life? Uh, and without that, you know, if the koan is just something over there. And I think the same through in same thing is true in a way of a work of art. Um, so one of my favorite koans uh, is, is this. A monk asked Chao Chu, what is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? Chao Chu answered, a cypress, the cypress tree in the garden. He's actually talking about like a particular tree. And um, the, the, the first part, probably a lot of you know who Bodhidharma is. He was the Indian ancestor who brought uh, the heart of Zen practice to China. So at that, you know, so the, the point of view is China and the India is to the West. So why did he come and do this? What is the point of Zen is the meaning of that question. Um, what's, the, wh what's all this for? And sometimes that question is asked like as a sincere question by a, a practitioner. Sometimes it's asked by a teacher. It comes up all, all the time. It's kind of a classic. It's a little bit like, uh, what is Buddha? And with these questions, there's often different teachers at different moments will give different answers. So Chao Chu said, it's the cypress tree in the garden. And he meant that particular actual real tree that was right over there. It's like the ginkgo outside my window in New York or the maple in my backyard um, outside of the city. It's like an actual tree, but it's also not an actual tree. Um, and how do we, how do we understand that? Um, Several other koans uh, are like this. Um, so there's uh, there's the the monk who asked Matsu, "What is Buddha?" Matsu says, "This very mind is Buddha." But later, a different monk asked him, and he said, "No mind, no Buddha." Or a monk asked uh, Dongshan, "What is Buddha?" And he said, three pounds of flax." And in some versions of the story, he's actually weighing out flax as he answers the question. So he's like, mm, three pounds. I think it's about three pounds. <laughs> um, a monk asked Yunmen, what is Buddha? And Yunmen said, a dried shit stick. And he was talking about the little sticks that people used instead of toilet paper at that time and place. Yeah. So imagine yourself for a moment taking in one of these koans. So in a way, they're all the same, but in a way, they're very, very different. If you're going to practice with the cypress tree, your set of associations, how it comes alive in your life is going to be different than if you practice with ordinary mind or no mind, no Buddha, or three pounds of flax, or of course, the shit stick. <laughs> Everything that comes up is going to be different even if they're in some sense all pointing to one thing. So if the question's the same and the answer is the same, but the answer is also different. And, and uh, this, is, this is because the answer is alive. The answer is alive. It's not a dead thing. It's not a thing you can just talk about. Um, so what if we thought about works of art for a moment as asking you, when you encounter them, asking you a question, sort of like a Zen master, like one of the other class, classic questions they ask is, where have you come from? Um, what is Buddha? What is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? What's the point of this thing that we're doing together? So the other day I went to look at some art. There was a show by an artist whose work uh, I've loved for a long time named Felix Gonzalez Torres. And some of you might know his work, um, 
but he was uh, he was born in 1957, which is a couple of years before me, um, and came to New York. He was born in Cuba. He came to New York for his art education and went through quite a lot of uh, fancy institutions um, and became an important person in the art world uh, in the 80s. Uh, but this was the 80s and he was a gay man. Um, so he was also right at the center of the AIDS crisis. And uh, his lover, Ross Laylock, um, was diagnosed with AIDS in, I think, 19, 1988. Uh, and then he died in 1991. So this was just, became a huge central part of Felix's life and work. Um, and then Felix himself uh, died of AIDS related complications in, I think, 1996. Uh, so I think the first time that I saw his work was at the Guggenheim Museum in 95. So that's about a year before his death. He had a huge retrospective in a museum. And um, there was, there were lots of different kinds of work, but there was one there was one work or set of works in particular that really struck me. They were these uh, just stacks, big stacks of posters. So they looked from a distance like a sort of minimalist cube. They kind of used that aesthetic vocabulary. But the idea was that you could take one as a visitor. And um, this was the first time I'd ever encountered anything like that in a museum space. And I was like, I'm not taking one. <laughs> like, I'm not allowed to take one. <laughs> And uh, I had to really watch lots of other people take them and ask the guards and they know the guards like, yes, you can take one. You know, I had to like, I was really paralyzed. Um, but finally, I kind of broke through my barrier and I uh, took some posters. Um, and that moment, that breaking through of that barrier of the formality of the museum space became just uh, hugely transformational for me. Uh, and there's another similar body of work of his, which is piles of candy. So it's basically some kind of candy, usually all one kind. And again, you can take a piece. Um, and one of the most sort of affecting or moving uh, ones of those pieces is one that he made that was a portrait of Ross, his lover, um, which the, the amount of candy in the pile weighed exactly what Ross weighed. And so, and he made this in the year that Ross died. I don't know if it was before or after, but you can just imagine the, the meanings of take, what it means to take that candy off the pile um, oh, out of that uh, portrait from that body in a way. So I've seen his work lots of times and I've taken lots of candy and lots of posters and I, I never eat the candy, I keep it. It's sort of like a little, you know, um, memento, I guess, a little mini artwork. Um, and the other day, so I went to David Zwerner's gallery, his big gallery. He's really one of like the top three or five galleries in the world, huge. I think there's four spaces in New York alone and they're gigantic museum-like powerful spaces. Um, and so I went in to find Felix's work and there were just a few pieces in the show. And so each one had a huge amount of space. And one of them was one of the candy works. It was called Untitled Public Opinion. And it was 700 pounds of black uh, licorice hard candy rods and clear wrappers spread uh, across the floor in a very formal and precise minimalist rectangle. And it was in a big white room um, with natural light pouring down from the sky. So it was uh, quite stunning and quite formal. And I had a, a, a moment of complete um, estrangement really and confusion like the the piece was really beautiful it was you could just it sort of scintillated in the light even though it wasn't moving it um it it had the sense you had the sensation looking at it that your eye would just couldn't could just keep looking among the different drifts of candy and light 
and um, shine and darkness forever. Um, but I was like, immediately I was like, oh, oh, here's a situation where we're not supposed to take the candy, clearly. Uh, this really felt like a museum, even more than the museum did. It was like, oh, I guess that moment is over and that this gallerist has a different idea about what this work is about, because clearly we are just not meant to take any candy. And I was just like, I stood there and then I was like, no, I know what the work's about. <laughs> like my conscious mind knew, knew what this was. I had done this before, <laughs> I was familiar with it. But my unconscious... Um, obedience to the rules of etiquette and formality and behavior and comportment in these settings was so strong that I was actually, uh, once again, completely uh, paralyzed. And I just, I like couldn't make myself take a piece for a long time. Finally, I walk around to the very back of the piece and I'm like I'm furtive I look is it can anyone see me is there a camera am I really supposed to do this I kind of edge out of the line of sight of some other people and I, I take a candy and then I slip it in my pocket like I'm stealing I'm like this is ridiculous part of me just knows that this is ridiculous but this is this is what I did and uh this is this is the candy <laughs> So I went back the next day, uh, and by then I'd had time to kind of process this response in myself and really, really remember in a deep way that I knew what these pieces were for and what they were, um, you know, how how you were meant to interact with them. And part of the thing of part of Felix's work is that there is no sign that says you can take one. That's that is part of the piece. So, and I knew. I, <laughs> so I went back and I'm like, okay, this time I'm going to take a candy and I'm going to eat one. And I really don't like licorice, but I just felt like this was the sort of antidote to my uh, previous experience. So I went in and again, it was a little bit hard, but I saw somebody else take one. I'm like, okay, right. Yeah. Everything's cool. And I took the piece and I uh, put it in my mouth, um, unwrapped it put it in my mouth and uh, it was this oh explosion in my mouth of licorice flavor it's like bitter and herbal and strange and I've you know really never liked it and and then as the licorice the first burst of that faded it was just suddenly intensely sweet oh my gosh and this seemed uh like to me in that moment like it tasted exactly like public opinion and though I don't know this for a fact, I really don't know. Um, I took the name of the piece. I took the public opinion that Felix was talking about to be a public opinion about AIDS um, in particular, but th this was the taste of public opinion. Whoa. And I, I, I left the room with the piece and there was a catalog on a desk nearby. And so I was just flipping through some of his work um a little bit distracted from the candy uh when i suddenly noticed that the candy had dissolved into a, just a thin rod just a perfect little thin cylinder in my mouth and then the candy was a sliver so fragile and then it broke apart and then it dissolved and then it was just a lingering sensation And later, as I was leaving the gallery, I was on the street and I put my hand in my pocket and there was the wrapper. And to my fingers, it just felt like an ordinary little bit of trash. It was just, uh, and in a way, of course, it was just the most ordinary little bit of trash. So what is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West. What is Buddha? What is art? What is AIDS? What is dying? What is public opinion? A licorice candy dissolving in my mouth. 